<laughs> Wake up, everybody. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Susan Rattan, and I will be your service leader today. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. And I uh, do this with, of course, Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and with uh, many volunteers, Karen Mills, uh, John Pater, Ruth Marriott, a bunch of other people who are helping send this out to people watching on Zoom. Sorry, what? And Pauline on the camera. Oh, yes, sorry. Um, I, we are one of two Unitarian churches in Edmonton and part of a network of UU churches across the country, large and small. Our congregation is a mosaic of free thinking, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. We gather in gratitude this morning on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility and a relationship. May we remember that we live in a city with 87,000 Indigenous residents, more than any other city except Winnipeg. That is a special a blessing and responsibility. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all of our children. Uh, before we get going, please silence all your devices. And, oh, I have no idea about announcements, and neither does she. So there are no announcements. And today we are going to be talking about hospitality. We will begin our service with a prelude. Thank you, Karen. We will light our chalice today. Jones Harvey is going to do the honors, and uh, Reverend Rosemary and I are going to read words by Sherry Woodbury. Welcome, who come in friendship, who long for genuine community. May you be graciously received here as your authentic self. Welcome who come in curiosity, full of questions or simply open. May you embrace wonder and encounter new delights. Welcome who come heavy with fatigue, weary from the troubles of the world or the troubles of your particular life. May you rest and be filled in this sacred space. Welcome who come with joy for flowing rivers and gentle breezes, for changing skies and great trees. May the grace of the world leave a lasting imprint on you. Welcome who come with thanks for the altruism of the earth and the gift of human care. May your grateful heart overflow and bless those around you. Come. Let us celebrate. Oh, both of us. Yes. Come. <laughs> Let us celebrate, celebrate together, together this, this wondrous, wondrous life. life. Thank you, Jones. <laughs> 
All right, we are now going to sing hymn 1000, Morning Has Come. Words will be on your screen at home and here. And there they are. So the service leader gets to give a little reflection, and so here goes. I came to Edmonton in 1996 to work at the Edmonton Journal. It was my fifth newspaper and my fifth time I moved to a new city for work. And one of the things I knew is that I had to build a life, build a community that was beyond the newspaper world. And in particular, I had had in Calgary a women's spirit circle that was really important to me. So the first thing I did, it took me a year, was to find a group of women to become a spirit circle. And we are still carrying on. But I also quickly knew I needed a bigger spiritual community than six women who meet once a month. And so I started sampling churches and that took several years until 2001 when I got to this church and realized this is it, this is where I belong. And uh, now I come all the time, I do a million things because it's my community. And I wanted to share with you just a couple of little things from the last couple of weeks that tell me that it's my community. The First thing happened at the choir's, choir, the choir's first practice 10 days ago. Gordon Ritchie, who is back there, one of our choir leaders, shared with us that he's going to, he wants to and is going to write a couple of new songs for us. Gordon has written numerous songs for us and they're all beautiful, singable, and the words are meaningful. And he just does this, he doesn't get asked to do it, he doesn't get rewarded for doing it. It's a gift to us. And that just blows me away. I just love that. Secondly, a service just in the last couple of weeks, I was talking to people afterwards and told them I'd, I now have a sore knee. And of course, a numerous people here have sore knees, as it turns out. And, <laughs> we go, and I got to hear stories from people and, uh, and how they dealt with it, and I found that really helpful. And on top of that, uh, Ellen Logan then sent me an email saying, she has a, a cream that she puts on her sore, sore knee, would I like a sample? So I got that as well. And that just seemed to me what community does for you. You don't just sit around and mope about your own sore knee, you share all your troubles with everybody else. <laughs> Third thing, last week uh, I was sitting over there 
and I got to talk to Jones Harvey, who is right there. Jones has been coming here for a year, apparently, and I, we've never talked before, and what a waste that was. And we just had this classic little Unitarian conversation about, well, I never really liked churches, and I, I organized religion, I don't know about that, but I do need, need a spiritual home, and we both worked our way here where we belong. And that was very nice. And uh, that's going to be it for me. Now, just let me see. Uh, oh, sharing our abundance. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all the fi financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and institutional well-being. So now we need people to pass the collection plate, and I think that's about to happen. And anybody who needs a tax receipt should put their do donation in an envelope, and there are usually envelopes in the gray hymn book, and you need to put your name on it as well. And you can also donate by going to our website, hit the donate button, and you will find, uh, you can donate with your credit card or by e-transfer. So that's very easy. In addition to supporting this church community, we make a monthly commitment beyond our walls. Half of the unidentified cash that is received is given to an outdoor, outside organization. For this month, our charity is Camp Firefly, a leadership retreat for queer and trans youth and an old friend of this congregation. All right. Now, we with, stay seated and we're going to sing From You I Receive. <laughs> Reverend Rosemary is going to lead the responsive reading, and your, your words will be up there. Let's see how we've got it set up here. Okay, I'm going to read the first ones, the italicized, and you're going to read the bold. So that's how it's going to work. My paper looks different than the screen, so we had to get that sorted out. To worship by Jacob, Jacob Trapp. To worship is to stand in awe under a heaven of stars before a flower, a leaf in sunlight, or a grain of sand. To To worship is to work with dedication and with skill. It is to pause from work and listen to a strain of music. Worship is a loneliness seeking communion. It is a thirsty land crying out for rain. Worship is the mystery within us reaching out to the mystery beyond. Thank you. Please join in singing the next hymn, hymn number 128, for all that is our, our life. It is in the charcoal hymn book, and it will also appear before us. Hymn 128, please rise in body or in spirit as you are able. Thank you. 
So the message this morning is titled, Hospitality is a Form of Worship, and that phrase came from the Babylonian Talmud. And the reading this morning is called Radical Hospitality by Marilyn Sewell, and I found it on the UUA website, uua.org. And this is kind of an excerpt from it. It's really, really long. You don't want me to read the whole thing. We'd be here past lunch. Radical hospitality. Radical means out of the ordinary, revolutionary even. So what would it mean to receive someone, a stranger, with a presence that was not just polite, but to receive them with revolutionary generosity? Activist Rosemarie Harding remembers her growing up days in the South. She especially remembers the hospitality of her mother, Ella Lee, and her great-grandmother, Moriah, or Mama Rye, as she was called. She was born in Africa, was a slave in Virginia, and died in 1930 at the age of 107. Both these women cultivated a deep hospitality. Harding says, as well as a profound mystic spirituality. And I've heard in the last few days this connection between mysticism and hospitality. And I'm really interested in that, and I haven't dove into that yet, but I'm going to. In the years that Harding was growing up, her house was a regular stop for neighbors and relatives and friends. Hospitality is a word with a spiritual history. As a matter of fact, monasteries grew up around the 5th century, and strangers in need would come there for care. The first primitive hospitals, in fact, began there. Hospital, hospice, hospitable, hospitality, all come from the same root word, meaning generous, caring, sustaining. The famous of, uh, most famous of these monasteries was that of St. Benedict. Benedict created a book of rules to live by called the Rule of Benedict, which is still used today by many monasteries. The foundation of the rule is listening. Listen with the ear of your heart, the rule says. Listen with the ear of your heart. And yet, the kind of warm-hearted generosity described by Rosemary Harding is more difficult in our day and age, more difficult in the city than in the small town. Most of us live in places distant from our relatives, places where neighbors come and go. We drive into our underground or into our little garages and go in through the garage, and we never venture onto the street. Radical hospitality is a term that rolls easily off the tongue. To actually carry it out is a demanding undertaking. But we are not a department store, not a government agency, nor a medical office. In all these places, one would expect to be received politely, served, as is our due. No, we are a congregation, and it is appropriate that we ask ourselves, what is it? What is the moral dimension of our hospitality? The moral dimension of our reception to others, of our solidarity with others who may not look like us or move from the same assumptions of values or values. I'm not talking, she says, about being politically correct or legalistic. I'm talking about hospitality as a spiritual practice. I'm not talking about just opening the doors. I'm talking about opening the heart. A congregation committed to radical hospitality would go beyond seeking out others like themselves for mutual support. Such a congregation would recognize huma the humanity of anyone who walks into that church. And such a congregation would concern themselves with people who feel beyond the reach of organized religion as Susan mentioned. End of quote. It's a long one, but I cut out a lot, just so you know. <laughs> there was a lot I didn't read. So this week I streamed into, actually yesterday, I streamed into a memorial service of a woman I knew well in Kamloops. 
She died recently at 101. During the reflections and remembrances, one particular quality of this dear woman shone through. Over the years, her house was a hub of visitors and guests. People dropped in, popped over, and lingered. She had a ready smile. I used to think sometimes, how come you're so happy, Betty? My goodness. She had a kind heart and a very generous spirit. Hospitality was her spiritual practice. That open door policy is really hard to do in big cities like Edmonton, as mentioned in the reading. I wonder, though, what it would be like if UCE become one of those hubs on a Sunday morning where folks felt like they could pop in, drop by, and linger, or our other act, any of our other activities through the week. We do a pretty good job, I think, of welcoming the newcomer. At least that's what I'm told by folks that are newcomers, that we did a pretty good job. I wonder, though, how we could change our thinking a little bit so that our welcome, our hospitality toward one another was part of why we are here. Let, let me try to explain what I mean. When we think of hospitality, we usually think of welcoming the newcomer and the stranger. That's very important, of course. But hos hospitality also means being kind and welcoming to people that arrive here, that come often or sometimes to UCE. I don't think we know each other well enough. And COVID has had a lot to do with that. It's not our fault. We got out of the habit of having coffee after church. Soup Sundays had to stop and still needs a champion to get that going again. And I'm sure there's a lot of other things that have changed since COVID. How do we practice radical hospitality to each other when we've gotten so out of practice? I have a few ideas, surprise, that you could think about or try. Maybe you could find someone you don't know very well and strike up a conversation after church, like Susan did last week. I invite you to go and get another cup of coffee after church, and there are some snacks, and linger before rushing off. You could join a Soul Matters group. There you will get to know folks and yourself even better. You could come to UU's on tap on September 25th at Brewster's, anytime after 5.30. Once a month, I hold a Food is for Fun. Friday is for Food and Fun. You could come to that and get to know people. Choir practice. And I'm sure we'll be adding more things as the year goes on. If anybody has some ideas about how to get together and do some fun things, let me know. The title of the service, as I said, Hospitality is a Form of Worship. As we become more hospitable, we will also become a place of caring, generosity, healing, and sustaining. I've had some feedback that I use the word worship too often. I'd like to talk about that for a moment. Worship means something of worth. When we 21st century, mostly white, mostly European settlers hear the word worship, we think of Christian worship and mistakenly believe that that word started with Christianity. It did not. Greco-Roman pantheists worshipped gods and goddesses. Buddhists visit temples and shrines and monasteries, set up altars in their homes, light incense, meditate and chant. All forms of worship. Buddhists also worship by radiating loving kindness to all living beings. We will be singing the loving kindness meditation hymn later on in the service. Pagans also worship. They have a deep spiritual connection with nature, and pagan rituals often celebrate the seasonal festivities, festivals. Paganism is a very diverse religion, and just amongst our own members are differing streams of beliefs, and examples of worship. 
Worship can be anything from lighting a candle, a stick of incense, singing a hymn, communing with nature, sharing an intimate moment with a loved one, or seeing the beauty in a sunset or a newborn's face. When I look up the word worship, it says, show reverence and adoration for a deity. Second description is, or definition is, honor with religious rites or practices. Example, the Maya, Maya built jungle pyramids to worship their gods. And I want to push back on it just a little bit. I think we need to broaden our definition so that worship doesn't have to include worshiping some god or goddess, but rather to recognize that we are doing something important together, something of worth. In other words, the second half of that definition, honor religious or spiritual rights. Here this morning we've come, and we have moved from what could be called ordinary time into time we take out of time for reflection and renewal. Special time that asks us to pay attention, dig a little deeper, create safer and healing spaces for one another, a place to find comfort, ritual, meditation, shared silence, singing, candles, poetry, all worship. A place we can rest for a little over an hour every week and be renewed. A place where we can go where we are accepted and appreciated. And if you don't feel accepted and appreciated, please come and talk to me. I will change that. If only I had a magic wand. This can be a place where we can celebrate differences and learn new things, like how important it is to use someone's preferred pronouns or their chosen name. My parents were known for their hospitality. My mother was, my mom was a fabulous cook. So guests would usually drop in not too long before dinner time for tea. So they could be invited or would be invited for dinner. Their hope would be that Ruth would cook them dinner, that there was, some, there was always something good in the sto on the stove or in the oven. And they were always invited, and my parents never minded. One act of their hospitality has always stuck out in my mind. During the summer in Chilliwack, where I was living at the time as a teenager, so that was, that was a few years ago, there would always be a few hitchhikers stranded on the Trans-Canada Highway in the, we called it the Cloverleaf, the overpass. This bothered my dad a lot. At that time, there were absolutely no amenities to walk to, so these folks just had to survive the night, whether it was pouring, which it rained a lot in Chilliwack, and hope for some better luck in the morning. One summer, my dad decided he was going to do something about it. Every evening, when the chance of getting a ride out of town got pretty slim, he went and picked up the one or two hitchhikers left on the highway. Some there were, sometimes there were none. Sometimes there were three. Mostly one. Sometimes two. He brought them home, which was, anyway. We fed them. They had a shower. We washed and mended their clothes. And then Dad put them back on the highway in the morning with food in their packs. It was interesting, to say the least. And when I look back on that summer, I shake my hand and my head at the audacity of it. There were some very interesting young people and older people, and it was a very interesting summer. He only did it the one summer. Either my mom put a stop to it or somebody put, said that it probably wasn't safe, especially with that precocious teenager living there. And maybe it wasn't, but I hope it made a difference in those young people's lives. Simple act of kindness. 
food, a shower, fresh sheets, clean and mended clothes goes a long way for someone stranded out on a highway far from home and family. I was chatting with a colleague the other day and we were comparing notes about what we were preparing for today. And then we began talking about how we as Unitarian re Universalists really, really struggle with spiritual language. It makes me remember back when I too really struggled with it. I, I used to call it my cross cringe. I was raised in a Christian home and, my, and began my journey toward becoming a minister with the United Church of Canada in the early 1900s, 1990s. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> I, you know what, I was afraid I was going to say that. I practiced it two or three times, but nope, I said it anyway. In the early 1990s, yeah, no. Anyway, I'm not a vampire. As my beliefs and theologies changed, it became apparent to me that I would not be able to carry through with becoming a minister in the United Church of Canada. As things changed, I became very uncomfortable with any word or phrase that was part of the Christian tradition. And as I became more spiritually mature and aware, I realized that these words and symbols are only attempts at helping us to put to words that which is impossible to put to words feelings and connections too deep and personal, awe and mystery that takes our breath away, and when overwhelmed by the kindness of a stranger, we sometimes say we are blessed. The words, the symbols, the rituals are all human ways to try to make sense of it all, from the seasons to the weather, the harvest, and even our own feelings. So, if I use the word worship, in my mind I am not using a Christian word, but rather a word that can depict what we are doing right now, right here in this sanctuary this morning. This time out of time can happen in a church, a mosque, a synagogue, a sangha, or around a fire deep in the woods. Unitarian Universalists do not have to believe any particular thing. And this means that there are people here from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, from all religions. That means that some folks don't like the thing that their neighbor dearly longs for. Some folks don't like the thing that their neighbor dearly longs for. The comfort of a familiar word or phrase one fee person feels might make someone else feel affronted. I think for Unitarian Universalism to work, we have to take a very generous stance and sometimes just translate for ourselves. This week marks the start of High Holy Days in the Jewish tradition. This is a special time for folks who follow the Jewish faith. There is much breaking of bread and eating of honey. People look back on the year and wonder if they have harmed anyone and then figure out how to make amends. During this week, many will welcome one another and share meals in their homes. The year begins anew. And with the new year, repaired relationships and closer connections. Next Saturday will be Yom Kippur, and people will gather to sing, to pray, to worship, to eat. What amends might you and I need to make? I know I got a few. And as we go through the week, we could think about that and maybe write an email or text to someone we haven't connected with in a while. Maybe to make amends. Maybe just to strengthen your relationship. Because isn't that what it's all about, building healthy relationships as we welcome each other and the newcomer into our space? Let us learn to make space for the newcomer. Let us learn to make space for each other, to let go of expectations of how things must be done, and to embrace hospitality in its many forms, and guises.
so may it be. Amen. I would like to invite you into a time of meditation and silence, and, and I have a kind of a usual way that I like to do this. I think, oh, I need to change this once in a while, and then I go, nah, no, I kind of like this. So, so I have a reading, a poem by Naomi Shihab Nye called Red Brocade. Red Brocade. Before I read it, I invite you to take a moment, if you will, to center yourself, squiggle yourself comfortably into your chair, squiggle or wiggle, whatever works for you, to begin to follow your breath, soften your gaze if you like, move about, plant your feet on the floor or however you find them comfortable. I invite you to just to follow your breath in as you take in all of that life-giving air into your body and then slowly release it as you let go of all that no longer serves you. Do that a couple of times, noticing how the air brings you comfort how the air sustains you and brings you life. And then to release it with the thought of letting go of all those preconceived notions you do not, you no longer need. I'll read the poem once and then we'll have a moment of silence I will read it again, a little bit more silence, and then we will sing the hymn filled with loving kindness, a Buddhist form of worship radiating loving kindness out into the world. The Red Brocade. The Arabs used to say, when a stranger appears at your door, feed them for three days before asking who they are, where they've come from, where they're headed. That way, they'll have the strength to answer. Or, by then, you'll be such good friends, and you don't care. Let's go back to that. Rice, pine nuts, here. Take the red brocade pillow. My child will serve water to your horse. No, I wasn't busy when you came in. And I wasn't preparing to be busy. That's the armor everyone puts on to pretend they had a purpose in the world. I refuse to be claimed. Your plate is waiting. We will snip fresh mint into your tea. Invite you into a moment of silence. The Arabs used to say, when a stranger appears at your door, feed them for three days before asking who they are, where they've come from, where they're headed. That way, they'll have enough strength to answer. Or, by then you'll be such good friends you don't care. Let's go back to that, shall we? Rice, pine nuts. Here, take the red brocade. 
and then my child will serve water to your horse. Mm, no, I was not busy when you came, and I was not preparing to be busy. That's the armor everyone puts on to pretend they had a purpose in the world. I refuse to be claimed. Your plate is waiting. We will snip fresh mint for your tea. And some silence. remain seated. way of sharing our loving kindness is to think about those around us, sharing our joys and concerns with one another by lighting a candle, making it visible that there are things in our hearts that need to be made visible. I invite you to light a candle of joy or concern or bewilderment or confusion, or clarity, whatever it is that has struck you this week. May you think about that as you come and light a candle. I invite you now, there are two stations open.
As Susan lights uh, last candle, representing all the joys and concerns that we have yet to articulate, may we remember that all of these candles represent real things, and let's hold them together in our hearts. And I'd like to invite you to sing our closing hymn, Building a New Way, hymn 1017 in the Green Hymn Book. We are building a new way. we go. We will extinguish the cha chalice and um, yes, come on up. The words by David Breeden. Let's be the welcome we crave. Open hearts, arms outstretched. Let's embody radical welcome, unquestioning love. Let's be the welcome we crave, deeply hearing voices and hearts. Let's be the welcome we crave, enriching understanding. Let us embody the community we crave. And now, benediction. Benediction this morning is written by Alina Westerbrook, a holy and generous love. Go in hope. For the arc of the universe is long, and we together can bend it toward justice. And go in courage, for together we have the strength to confront injustice in our daily lives and in the larger world, and go in love. For a holy and generous love is both the reason and the means by which we transform the world. Go in love, go in peace, gentle people, go in peace. Amen. And let us gather together and do the windy thing. The windy, the windy circle-y thing. And sing together our linking song, Carry the Flame. The words are up. It's a shape. For those of you that are new, thank you for being here. Okay. That's not bad. I need to be muted because I'm going to sing. <laughs>